if they're doubting the biblical faith, I want them to know that they're they're not alone. They are in good company because the Bible is full of doubters. Abraham, Moses, Job, David, Peter, Paul, Thomas, I mean, they all doubted. And so when doubts come, just know you are in good company. What is the most difficult objection for Bible defenders to answer? What questions about the Bible stump most Christians? The show you're watching is called Can I Trust the Bible? So can you? My brother, Tim Barnett from the Red Pen Logic YouTube channel is here to be grilled. And as we ask these super uncomfortable questions, make sure you're subscribed if you're watching us on YouTube. Most people who watch our show are not yet subscribed. So please do if you haven't already. It genuinely helps facilitate more conversations just like this. Tim, my brother, how are we doing? I'm doing well. I'm a little nervous now after that intro though. Um, I'm, I'm worried about some of these questions you're gonna ask me. Well, that's the point, man. We get you know questions sent to us that are, that are the tough stuff. And I'm like, okay, let's save them all in a bank. And then when Tim gets here, we'll just, we'll let it rip. So let me just get right for the jugular. All right, you ready? Sure. Okay. Go for it. So sure. the idea is that we have free will, right? God gave us the opportunity to reject him, to sin, do what we want. Mm -hmm. But if God is all powerful and all knowing, and he knew what we were gonna do at the end of the day, do we really actually have free will? All right, this is this is interesting because I've, I've thought about that, this question before. And I, I think the problem here is there's a mistaken understanding of how God's foreknowledge actually works, mm. okay? It assumes that God's foreknowledge somehow causes my actions. And if it causes my free will actions, then I must not be free. Here's how philosophers put it, okay? They'll say that, my free will actions are logically prior to what God foreknows, but God's foreknowledge is chronologically prior to my actions. Okay. Mm. Now thinking about that may give you like intellectual <laughs> constipation. Okay. Right. Like that's a, that's a hard thing to wrap our minds around, but I like that eloquent way that you put it. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's a, here's a little illustration that might be helpful. Let's just say tomorrow I will freely choose to eat fruit loops for breakfast. Okay. Now, if that's the case, then God would have always believed that I would choose to eat fruit loops for breakfast. That's what he would have known. However, if I say instead chose to eat Cheerios tomorrow for breakfast, all right, then it would be the case that God would have always believed that I would eat Cheerios. Hmm. Okay. So again, my free will actions um, are what is determining what God has always believed. Hmm. And I think that's, that's really um, important to kind of get that uh, understanding under our belts. Uh, an illustration, actually, I heard William Lane Craig, who's just this really smart Christian philosopher. Ridiculously brilliant. He uses this yeah, ridiculously brilliant. He says that God's foreknowledge is kind of like this infallible barometer of the weather. So a barometer helps us forecast or foretell what the weather's going to be like. Now, imagine you have a barometer that like is never wrong. Okay. It never fails. Of course we know the weather guys get it wrong. So we got to imagine this one never fails. Clearly it's not the infallible barometer that, de that determines the weather. No, the weather mm. is what determines what the barometer is going to foretell or forecast. If the weather were different, then the barometer would be different. All right. So I guess the take home is my free will decisions cause God's knowledge. God's knowledge doesn't cause my free will decisions. Brilliant, brother. Brilliant. And we have a few more questions that kind of deal with this whole foreknowledge, predestination stuff. But there's one sure. question that's bothered me and maybe okay. uh, driven me into the field of apologetics. And it goes something like this. And actually, it's, it's been you know, posed to me by my father, who's Hindu. I used to go to the Middle East a lot. Mm. And so, you know, I was around a lot of Muslims and Jewish folk and they'd ask this question and I would, I would have some hard time piecing the logic together to give them a coherent statement. So now that we have you, give us the truth. Okay. So the, the argument goes like this, Hey, 
if you were born in India, more than likely you're going to be Hindu. If you were born in Syria or Saudi Arabia, probably going to be Muslim. You know, if you grew up in Israel, obviously probably going to be Jewish. And a lot of these folks, all you know, they they're genuinely seeking God. Like you know, the Buddhist monks who like dedicate their life to it, or you know, folks at the Western Wall, these Orthodox rabbis who are genuinely seeking God, or you know, imams and Damascus who are genuine. So it's not it's not for a lack of effort, but mm -hmm. according to Christian theology, would God send those people to hell because they were born in the wrong place? So I think there's a number of things going on in, in this question, but kind of at the core is this the problem of uh, the unevangelized. Like what happens to those who actually never hear the gospel, right? Uh, like they never hear about Jesus and they're worshiping God in the best way they know how, the way you put it, you know, they're, they just kind of love the wrong God or something. Um, you know, if they, if they actually go to hell, then is it just because of like an accident of geography being born in India or Yemen or wherever? Well, here's where I want to start. No one goes to hell because they've never heard the gospel or never heard about Jesus. Okay. And no one goes to hell because of some accident in geography. You were born in this place instead of this place. No, according to scripture, people are going to face judgment because of their sin. Mm. Okay. That's, that's clear from scripture. And by the way, one of those sins is loving the wrong God, loving a false God. The Bible calls that idolatry. Mm. Okay. Now I want to say more about the seeking idea here in a second, because I think this is, is, an, is an important element to it, but the Bible actually, it's really important that when we answer these kinds of questions, we want to go to God's word for our answer. And sometimes God's word um, is explicit in its response, and sometimes it's more um, implicit. Well, I think the Bible actually gives us some clues about how to respond to this question, in particular in the book of Romans. Mm. Okay, So if you read the book of Romans, the first three chapters, what you find out is um, God's knowledge is uh, clearly perceived to everyone. Okay, It's through his nature and through our, our uh, through our conscience. And what it says there is, this is enough knowledge that actually makes us um, without excuse, okay? So you can't say, well, I didn't know enough about God. Chapter three actually goes on to say, and there's another problem. So you know some stuff and you've committed sins against this God. Okay, that's a problem. And as you start to read on in Romans, you find out that there's a solution, okay? Um, that we must believe, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. This is Romans chapter 10. Now, what's really cool about Romans chapter 10, it, it, it anticipates this particular challenge that you just offered. If you go to um, Romans 10, 13 and 14, it says this, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that's actually a quote from the Old Testament and the Lord in reference there is Yahweh in the Old Testament, but actually in the context of Romans is actually Jesus, which is wild, okay? But then it says this, here's Paul's question. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they've, and here it is, never heard? Mm. And how will they hear without someone preaching? And how will they preach without someone being sent? Paul's line of argumentation is pretty clear and straightforward. If no one is sent, then there'll be no one there to preach the good news. And if no one preaches the good news, then no one will hear the good news. And if they don't hear it, how are they going to believe? And if they don't believe it, how are they going to call? How are they going to be saved? So I think that there, there's no easy answer to this question in the sense that I believe that scripture teaches you need to put your trust in Jesus. Okay, so let's go back to that person who's um, in India or in Yemen, they're following Islam or they're following um, Hinduism or whatever. What if they're truly seeking? And here's my conviction. And I get this conviction from the book of Acts. So we're just in Romans 10. Let's look at Acts chapter 10. You, you read about this guy named Cornelius and he seems to have it a lot going on for him, a lot of good things. Like he's, he's uh, a God-fearing man. He is giving alms. 
He's generous. There's all these attributes about him, but he has a problem. And that is he's not saved. He has never heard the gospel. And so what does God do for Cornelius? And I think this is not just a special case for Cornelius. I think this is how God responds to people who genuinely seek after him. He gives them more light. Mm. When they seek more light, he gives them more light. So in this case, it's wild. Cornelius gets a vision of Peter. And actually, it's an angel. An angel says, go send for this guy named Peter. What's fascinating is the angel doesn't give the message that he needs to hear. He says, you got to go hear the message from Peter. And I think that's important because we are involved in this process. Mm. So you have this, you have Cornelius. He isn't saved, but he's God-fearing. He's devout. He's generous. He's religious. He's all these things. Peter is actually really impressed by his spiritual life but he's not saved yet. He has to hear the message by which he must be saved. Come on. And so kind of here's, here's the take home. The more I study this question, the more I realize that the goal of scripture is actually not to answer this question, but to alleviate the need for the question. Okay. So the solution to the problem of those who haven't heard about Jesus or the gospel is you and it's me. Mm. There's no plan B here, right? God has the power to write the gospel in the stars, but he hasn't done that. In his wisdom, he's given us the responsibility to take this message to the four corners of the earth. Come on. So, um, yeah, so, so we're called to make disciples of all nations, especially these unreached nations where there are people like Cornelius and they're waiting for that individual. And I know you've probably heard stories. I've heard stories of individuals who are were in some of these um, yep. Muslim countries yep. and they're getting dreams, dreams and exactly. visions. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. So I think there is hope that God sees the heart and responds accordingly. And wow. so if people seek after him and they and they ask for more light, then God will give that that light. That's an encouraging word, my brother. And if if you're watching this, know that for some crazy reason the creator of two trillion galaxies wants to partner with you in this mission. Mm. Um, and that should not just encourage you, but motivate you. All right. So uh, on to the next one, Tim, I'm sorry. I'm not giving you much of a break. Uh, we, we only have you for a hot second. I want to get these questions in because again, yeah. these are the questions sure. that are being sent to us. And I think you, as you just proved, uh, answer these questions brilliantly. Right. And this one, this one's a spicy one. This one, I think, um, is very applicable to Western American Christianity. It's a question that I don't think you necessarily get, you know, in the Middle East or whatever. But, you know, you live in Toronto or outside Toronto. I live outside San Diego. This is, the, I think, a common version of this question. Are you ready? Here we go. Okay. Sure. So you're one of those Christian people. You believe in Jesus. and the, Okay, that's fine. That's basically adult Santa Claus. Like, come on. like. Let's be honest, like you just want a warm blanket so that you're not scared of death. And there's just going to be this like, mm -hmm. you know, nice, comfy, cozy at the end of the day. You, come on. Just, and just like Santa Claus, when you were seven or eight, by the way, if you have kids, now would be the time to maybe uh -oh. not have them watch. When you found out that Santa Claus wasn't real, one day you're going to come to the conclusion that this whole God thing, it was just your parents telling you some hot fluff. Come on, come on, come on, come on. What would your response be to that? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a couple of things going on here too. Um, notice that this challenge just assumes that God is like Santa Claus, right? God is made up just like Santa Claus. Now, it's clear that people understand that is an assertion. That's not an argument, right? I mean, I could easily just shoot back and say, no, God isn't like Santa Claus. God is real and Santa isn't, you know? So I can make assertions too. Um, but I think if we want to get somewhere with this, what we want to do is say, no, there are good reasons why brilliant men and women throughout human history Come on. have believed in the existence of God, but not in the existence of Santa Claus, right? It's because belief in God is grounded in good evidence and Santa Claus isn't. So Preach. that would be like the, the kind of the main distinction between those two. Actually, I actually wonder about this person who compares the two, because what it tells me is this person has not 
looked into the God question very deeply. Like if you're comparing God to Santa Claus, you have a very superficial understanding of the intellectual background of the arguments for God's existence. Now, you may not be persuaded by them, but let's be honest, let's be real here. There have been arguments offered that um, from some top tier level philosophers, okay? That's not happening for Santa Claus. <laughs> it's happening for God. Now, here's the second thing though, because I think this challenge actually smuggles in a logical fallacy. Mm. Um, Notice how, you know, it's a, you said these, it's like a warm blanket, you know, it adds emotional support. You know, people like Santa Claus. That's why they believe in God. They just want to have this, this Santa Claus like figure who will take care of them and, and give them gifts or whatever. And I actually think, you know, when people argue this way, um, they're committing, um, something called the genetic fallacy. Okay. And that's when you focus on the origin of the belief and not that, not the content or the reasons for why people hold the belief. Okay. So whenever you're faced with a challenge and the person focuses in on, um, your emotional state or your psychological state, mm. you're just believing that because right. you need a psychological crutch or something. Right. Now look at, I, maybe I do need a psychological crutch, but that doesn't mean that my belief isn't well justified, Come on. right? So we have to look at the reasons themselves. And so this is a, this is a huge red flag. Um, you know, it was, it was funny, Stephen Hawking, he famously said, you know, religion is a fairy tale for people afraid of the dark. And uh, this brilliant uh, Oxford mathematician, John Lennox, he responded, well, atheism then is a fairy tale for people afraid of the light. Come you know? on. And, and Dude, John and Lennox is a like, boss. Can we just admit that? He, John Lennox, if you happen to be watching this show, we love you. <laughs> well, he should, he should be on here answering these challenges. But he, um, he, what he was doing there was pointing out that 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 kind of argument cuts both ways. You know, mm. if you say I believe because of psychological factors, well, I could say you believe for psychological factors. Okay, two can play at that game. The point is, our psychological motivations can give us um, information about uh, the one who holds the beliefs, me. But it can't tell you anything about the truth Come of on. those beliefs. And if you want to know about the truth of the belief in God, you got to go to the evidence. Let's go. And Tim, that's kind of one of the reasons we started this channel. And if you want, I don't know, proof of the resurrection of Jesus, we actually have an entire video with Sean McDowell. We'll link in the description. Or if you want proof that the Bible hasn't been changed, that, that, that scriptures, scripture is reliable, we have a video with Dr. Michael Icona, which will also put in the description. So if you want, you know, these kind of, uh, basically we want to equip you with the fact that this isn't just a, a fantasy, a fairy tale, but it's rooted in reality and history and facts and truth. Uh, again, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel because that's kind of why we created it. Um, speaking of our YouTube channel, though, probably the most often asked question is this, and this is maybe the most difficult one to answer, my brother, which is this. How could an all-loving, all-powerful God not stop the seemingly unnecessary, horrific evil that we find in the world? We, you know, I, I have a, I guess you could call him the sort of famous friend uh, who famously deconstructed. And one of his main arguments was seeing this, the, the seemingly unnecessary suffering of kids, right? In Africa, there's some disease that eats the eyeballs out of kids. What the heck, mm. God? Like, what? why did you create that? So what What would your, you know, or, you know, what we're seeing in Ukraine or why, why? Like, what, why, God, couldn't you have created a universe where that suffering, that evil wasn't present? What would your answer be to that? Yeah, I, I would want to start by prefacing this whole uh, response by saying this is a very real problem that many of us are experiencing. So it's not just an intellectual question, although you kind of posed it as this like intellectual, you know, if God is all powerful, he's all good, he's all knowing. Okay. Why is there all this evil and suffering in the world? That That's a question. Um, the problem is many of us have experienced mm -hmm. this question at a very deep level. 
And so I want to recognize out of the gate that what I say in the next few minutes probably isn't going to be adequate to meet yeah. the challenge because I, I actually think it's one of the most difficult challenges that uh, is, has ever been raised against Christianity. And, and so I start there and then I want to tease out the fact that there's a difference between the emotional challenge mm. and the intellectual challenge. Yep. Right. Um, and, and so here, you know, when people are going through suffering, I want to respond in a certain kind of way. Um, I'm going to, you know, wrap my arms around that person. Maybe they need a hug. Maybe they need a shoulder to cry on. Okay. And then there's other times where it's more academic, you know, it's the philosopher, you know, just wondering about these things. And that requires that kind of careful thinking intellectual response. So let's kind of go in that direction. Um, just making sure we understand the difference between the emotional and the intellectual side of this. I actually think there's a number uh, of ways that we can respond to the problem of evil. Um, one is to point out that at least for certain kinds of evil to um, be a problem in the world, like for something to be immoral, um, we would want to say that there must be morality, an objective morality. That's if it. you don't believe in objective morality, then you can't raise mm -hmm. um, the challenge of, mm -hmm. of evil and good for that matter. I mean, I think Richard Dawkins famously said that in, in a world of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces, genetic replication, you know, some people are going to get luck, uh, hurt. Some people are going to get lucky and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. He says at bottom, there's no good, no evil, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. So I think that there's a sense in which you need God as an objective standard or source yep. of morality to even raise the challenge, um, at least the, the moral challenge um, that's out there. So that might be a, a place to start, but there's, there are, there have been different defenses offered. A defense would be, here are some possible reasons why God would permit evil. A theodicy is here's an actual reason, like whether it's from scripture or common sense or whatever. And some of those theodicies look backward to like creation and the fall and free will. And some look forward to, you know, making us into a better person. Um, so look at our character. So for example, you know, as a Christian, I would say, look, you just mentioned this, this insect that eats the, eye, uh, you know, the eye of a, of a child and that that's horrible. And what I would want to say is, well, the world that God originally created, like the garden, that very good garden that God created wasn't like that. Okay. So the world isn't the way God originally had made it. And I mean, you just have to read the first few pages of scripture to find that out. Okay. It was good. It was good. And then there was a fall and now it's not so good. So that's part of it. I think that in the garden, God gives free will. And this allows for at least the possibility of evil, mm -hmm. right? And suffering yep. um, because humans make those kinds of choices. I mean, we it's not just Adam and Eve. We make those choices every day. There are right. choices that individuals are making today that are causing more suffering and more evil. Right. Okay. And, and so, and we could say, well, why didn't God stop them? Well, I, he would have to take away our free will in, in some, in some respect for that to take place um, or, or change us from the inside out. Because frankly, um, if he's committed to creating free human beings a certain way, then it may be a logical impossibility mm. to, um, to stop all the evil in the world. I know Alvin Plantinga, a famous philosopher, he gave this free will defense. Yeah. But there's other defenses. There's soul-making theodicies. Look at there's there are instances of suffering in my life that I didn't like when I was going through yeah. that suffering. But I know I can look back through the rearview mirror and say, that has made me a better human. Come on. That has made me a better person. So um, I mean, and we see that by the way, that's in scripture too. Um, we see this kind of thing. Like God allows this kind of discipline to happen in our lives, these trials, because it produces a better person on the other end. And there's greater good theodicies. Um, think of like Joseph, you know, who gets sold into slavery by his brothers. He, you know, eventually works his way up in Potiphar's house. He actually gets falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, gets thrown in prison. I mean, just really a lot of horrible things happen to Joseph. And then he works his way up into Pharaoh's house. And, um, his brothers end up coming to him and he says to his brothers who sold him into slavery, 
as for you, you meant evil against Come on. me. Come on. But God meant it for good. Bless what God. good? What good could all that suffering to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as Bless they are today? God. So here we have an example of greater good uh, a theodicy where God allows, permits, whatever word you want to use, evil and suffering for some greater purpose. By the way, Jesus' death on the cross, which, I mean, was one of the most wicked acts. I mean, they killed the son of God. Yeah. What good, what good could possibly come from that? How about this, you know, the salvation of wow. all who believe, you know, this kind of thing. So, and then, okay. And then, so we can list all those different defenses or theodicies. And then we could still say at the end of the day, I don't know. Mm. Because mm. there's still, even when I, I can explain this and I explain this and I explain that, I, there's still, there's still some of this stuff in the world that I'm just like, you know what? I don't know. Yeah. Um, and that's just the realest answer I can give. And I'll just say, God knows. Yeah. God's, I mean, I, I don't, again, I'm not trying to punt to like God's ways are higher than our ways. Um, but there's a sense in which the creator of the universe, yeah, he is higher than me. His ways are higher than his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. There are things he knows that I don't know. And so from my finite perspective, I may not have all that worked out, whereas he does. Tim, you are, you navigated that brilliantly. Uh, and so if you're watching this, obviously subscribe to the Red Pen Logic YouTube channel because my, my boy, Tim, he unpacks every question you can imagine um, on his channel. And the way you just uh, swam through that landmine was, uh, was impressive and, and very, 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 very helpful. Obviously, we're going to have to have you back. Obviously, we're going to have to do a lot more videos like this because we have you know, a billion questions on here. We only have time for a few. But I want to end with this question, which is this. Let's say my buddy here who's watching this is going through a very famous thing amongst millennials and Gen Z, which is the idea of deconstruction, right? They, they grew up in the church and then they get to like college and they're like, ooh, wait a minute. Is this, what, am, what, what, what is, is this real? Am I, am I believing something because my parents told me? Then they start going online, which is a, you know, a fun exercise where you can find basically anything, any argument to, you know, deconstruct your theology. But you have my friend here who's watching this and they're, and they're struggling. They're genuinely struggling with doubt, with deconstruction, with, I, I don't know if I can believe this anymore. And there's different, obviously, degrees. Some people are just have that one little doubt in their mind where they're like, help me out with this. And then there's people that are like a foot out of the church. They're ready to, to bounce and they just happen to click on this YouTube video. So in closing, my, bu my buddy, uh, yeah. what would you say to them? Yeah. I would want to tell them that if they're doubting the biblical faith, I want them to know that they're they're not alone. They are in good company because the Bible is full of doubters, okay? Abraham, Moses, Job, David, Peter, Paul, Thomas, I mean, they all doubted. And so when doubts come, just know you are in good company, okay? Now, I would want to zero in on, I think the greater, the greatest doubter in the entire Bible, which is doubting John the Baptist. I know people are thinking I was going to say <laughs> doubting Thomas, but doubting John, John the Baptist. Now, what's interesting about John the Baptist is this guy is not the guy you'd expect to be doubting. I mean, he has some pretty serious religious credibility, right? He's like the, the son of a prophet. He is a, a priest. He is a prophet of God. He's um, Jesus' cousin. But if you know the story, he gets arrested, thrown in prison. And then he's starting to ask this question, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? So John expresses this question that probably most people thought, where is this coming from? This is the guy who is declaring Jesus the Messiah. And now he's saying, are you the guy? And so I think I would want to, I would want to encourage people who are listening to, to learn from John. Here's five things. John doesn't doubt in isolation. He doubts out loud. Come he on. expresses his doubt. He doesn't, ex he doesn't suppress okay. his doubt. When you suppress your doubt and you doubt in isolation, that is a faith killer. And so you want to express your doubts. Now, here's the second thing. Doubt with others, like people you can trust. Doubt yeah. with in community. So John, he's in prison. He sends word by his disciples. So he, he's he's tell he's talking about his doubts with his inner circle, with his disciples. And I think we need to be, as the body of Christ, 
the kind of people who people can come to and say, hey, I've got this question, I've got this doubt. And we don't shame them. We say, that's a great question. Let's talk about this. Yep. So we're gonna doubt in community. Third, we're gonna try to understand our doubts and their implications. I've seen so many people who started doubting some like secondary tertiary issue and that's what caused them just to leapfrog out of Christianity. And I'm thinking, wait a second, you left because of that? Like, I, they don't believe in like young earth creation or something anymore. And therefore they jump to atheism. And I'm thinking that's not how this works. You know, mm -hmm. even within Christianity, there's lots of views of creation that people hold. So understand your doubt. And then fourth, try to answer that doubt. Um, so you have this question or this doubt, put it in terms of a question and then go seek that answer out. And then finally, and that's what John did, by the way, he went straight to Jesus. Yeah. Are you the guy? And what is, what does Jesus do in response? He says, look, the blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the lame are walking. In other words, look at the evidence. Yep. The evidence is there. And I would encourage this person. I think the evidence is there. I think that, that um, Christianity is the best explanation of reality. Now, is it always tidy? No. Is it messy? Sometimes. Okay. Do I have all the answers? No, I'm an apologist and I got lots of questions. Okay. That still need answers. But here's the fifth thing. Always remember that Jesus can handle your doubts. Come okay? on. Jesus can handle your doubts. So I would want to encourage this person to press in and seek answers. Now there's a difference between between asking questions to seek answers and asking questions to seek exits. And sadly, as I'm on social media and I'm in the hashtag deconstruction um, world, we wrote a book about this. There's lots of people out there who I think are asking questions to get to find exits, not answers. Mm. And um, I, so I would just want to encourage that person to, to seek the truth because we have this promise that if you seek, you will find. But that seeking has to be genuine. It has to be with all of your heart. And so, so keep seeking. And as you seek, my prayer is that God will reveal himself and the truth of Christianity. Tim, my brother, that was brilliant. And if you're watching this and you love having these questions answered, make sure you subscribe to us right here on YouTube because that's why we created this channel, to, to, to answer the, the tough questions, to, to, to address those doubts that you have. So make sure you uh, also click the notification bell and give us a thumbs up uh, so that you never miss an episode of Can I Trust the Bible?